Hello. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you very well, yes. Okay, that's great. For, for coming tonight, I, I really, really appreciate it. As I was saying, um, I think one of the hardest parts about the pandemic is the, the lack of social interaction. So even this to me, it means so much to see you all to, you know, today speak with you and other times just to listen to what people are doing and, and, and thinking and how they're getting through um, this time. So I really appreciate you coming here tonight. Um, so my, my presentation tonight is called uh, Speaking Truth to Power, and it's, it's for many reasons uh, titled this. And um, I think we'll get there, uh, but it is essentially a homage to the people that I feel have helped me create this mentality of, of never backing down and kind of saying things when I think that something needs to be said. I'm gonna start with Rio. I have here, welcome to Rio. Um, because I feel like sometimes when I say that I'm Brazilian, it, it, it sounds a little abstract and, and sometimes it's not very clear to people what that means or what it looks like or what it feels like. And so I want to show you a little bit of what it looks like. Um, this is actually my neighborhood where I grew up. Um, this is, my mom is in this call. This is funny. She is here. She is right here <laughs> in this building here, this one. <laughs> and and you know, this is kind of the landscape that I grew up with. These beautiful, this is the, the Pão de Açúcar, the sugar loaf, which is kind of in the back. Everything's very hilly, so there's a lot of hills and valleys involved, um, as you can see here. This is the street market um, that happens every Saturday where you go and get your groceries. It's very warm always, it never gets cold. So this is kind of a social activity as well. Um, there's like a little square where there's music, live music happening, shooting. There's caipirinhas being sold, and so you go there and you kind of see your friends and you hang out with your friends. This is close to my house as well. I think this is actually my mom's building right here. And um, you can see a little bit of an older type of architecture of the city here. Um, it has largely become these big buildings, kind of cookie cutter buildings, but we still have a little bit of this kind of older type of architecture. And here on the bottom right, you see, this is kind of like, <laughs> I call it Brazilian sport. You just go out and kind of hang out at night in these little um, places that sell ice cold beer and some food and just hang out and talk and that's it. That's kind of what we do. If you know me, you've heard me talk about Carnaval a lot um, because it's such a big expression of, of who we are and, and our culture and the way that we live our lives kind of. This year it's complicated because apparently Carnaval has been canceled. I don't know what that's going to look like because Brazil right now is not being very great about the social distancing and whatnot. But this is what a regular Carnaval looks like. Like sees the people in the street and these little umbrellas you see are little vendors with, um, with ice cold beer. We usually go out in the daytime, you get your makeup on, your costume on, and you go out into the street and 9 a.m. you're having a ice cold beer and that's for three days officially, but at this point, Carnaval has become like a month long event. So, you know, this, and it can have a lot of political satire and commentary. So you see these women here on the bottom right. This is a photo Tame, which is the previous president. And there's a lot of like funny costumes, conversation piece type of costumes. It's very fun. And just so you see that I take this seriously, this is actually, on the top where I left, me and my sister are going out uh, to a block and it's for everyone. So here's my mom and I at a block <laughs> But here in the middle is my bottom middle is my dad going out to a block um, Here's me going out um, as a devil. I always go as a devil in the first day, kind of become a tradition. And here on the bottom left, my husband, Patrick, which <laughs> good for him, he got to experience this. <laughs> And me, my sister here, her partner, and a couple of friends with the obligatory uh, elevator salt. Okay. Yeah, so now we go to kind of like the more art part of things with the Federal University of Rio. And again, I always say this, and I think it'll become clear why I keep saying that art is an act of resistance. So basically, this is a photo that I love because it gives us a little bit of context of, of what the, the campus of the Federal University is. And the Federal, Federal University is free. 
right? So you, you go through a contest and you are accepted to it and you don't pay for your education essentially, it's free education. Um, and this is the federal university being built. Uh, it, was, it took decades to be completed and it was never truly completed. Another thing with Brazil, this is why we say Brazil is not for beginners, it's, uh, it's complicated. The history, the corruption, it's a lot. Um, but this is a man-made island. This is, this is all a landfill. And the campus was built in this artificial island. And this is actually the building where I went, I did my BFA. And you know, it looks a little boxy and kind of nondescript from far, but it's actually really beautifully constructed with huge windows that let in a lot of natural light. There's always a cross breeze, even though it's 110 degrees. So, you know, a lot of thought was put into building these buildings and it's at once a symbol of the Brazilian modernist utopia and its monumental failure. Um, on the right here, you see uh, how big <laughs> this construction is and how much attention they, they pay to having natural light and also kind of how unkept um, these places are. And, and at the same time, they're really beautiful. You see that they, you know, they're using all these natural, not natural, but local plants, tropical plants that, you know, really like this environment. So it's really well thought of. It's just not very well kept. You can see here on the bottom, a lot of infiltration and a lot of just kind of like that it's not being cared for as well as it should. Um, and then I give you a little bit of context. This is, uh, these are three or four big highways that kind of are in that general vicinity that connect the city to other places. So Avenida Brasil and a Linha Amarela, Linha Vermelha, Linha Vermelha, I believe. And here you see these people crouching here. They're crouching because of a firefight. And this was something that I experienced. Um, gladly, I never had to do this, but this was a fear. And many times, you know, you have to be well informed and sometimes there will be turf wars related to drug trafficking and whatnot. And basically I just wouldn't go because I knew that I might end up like this or God forbid, shot. This is not an accident either. This is just, you know, people trying to avoid a firefight as well. So this whole traffic here stops because there's a huge firefight happening and people are just like not going through it, afraid of being shot. And then on the bottom here, you see kind of the presence of the military, which is still very, very strong. We have police has, um, Brazil and Rio especially has kind of a police state. We live in a constant kind of fear of that. And here for constant context, this is the campus that I was showing you. And to the left is the Complex do Lemão, or Favela da Maré, which is one of the biggest and, and most violent um, slums slash communities that we have in, in Rio. It's huge. It goes as far as the eyes can see. And to the right here of the campus, you see the Guanabara Bay, which is so beautiful, but also really badly kept, very, very dirty, very polluted. Um, and I think this photo here on, on the right, just for a little more context, this is just such a, it, it sounds, it looks like a cliche, but actually this is like such a normal scene in Brazilian um, community slash songs that it's, it's not, it's just sad. And you know, I, I picked this particular photo because when you see this little girl, I was like, wait, does she have her hands up? And I noticed that no, she does not. She's actually eating a popsicle. You know, this is so normal in their lives that they're just kind of like hanging out and just not even, I don't, I don't know if aware or they're not necessarily afraid or of, of these huge assault weapons that are just right next to them. So this is kind of the shocking reality of, of Rio as well that I like commenting. And then in the midst of all this, we continue to make art, right? We, we don't stop. And so here's the inside of that big building that I'm showing you from the outside. And um, just for a sheer scale of it, this is the painting studio. It is, uh, <laughs> and I could not find uh, photos of the sculpture studio, which is also monumental and huge and just, you know, so the program for the, Fine arts school is, is a little, let's say, outdated. It's very uh, fine art in the sense of like the end of the sculpture program. Technically, you're supposed to create a horse, a sculpture, a real life size sculpture of a horse, an equestrian statue, like a colonial monument. 
Um, so obviously the professors, they are much more connected to contemporary art than that. So they obviously, that's not a requirement, but originally that's what it's meant to be. So it's this space that it's meant to, you know, build these massive sculptures, very large um, spaces. And I started creating these paintings, the, the written paintings uh, in the space, in the scale, partially because of the scale of the space, kind of trying to dialogue with this monumental building that is the, the Federal University of Rio. Um, and I was doing my own reading at the time because I felt the readings that we were doing weren't necessarily speaking to the things that I wanted to speak to. So I started just creating these massive pieces that had these authors and ideas that I wanted to bring into the, the spaces that I was working. And it, it worked because, you know, when I created these, people would stop and they would ask questions. They would want to know who wrote it, why I was doing it. And it was always a really productive, awesome conversation. And I always add the name of the author in the painting in hopes that people will be excited by the ideas and maybe look further into um, the ideas that I'm proposing. So this was kind of the first experiment. And it was, it, and again, we're going to, we're going to be cycling through these pieces that are usually paintings that are written, soft sculptures, and performance pieces. So this is kind of like how my work uh, happens. It kind of happens in these cycles between sculpture, painting, and performance. Um, while I was doing this, while I was doing my BFA, I was also founding an artist collective uh, named Group Pi. And it was a very horizontal, circular organization where people were welcome to join. If they wanted to work, if they wanted to be a part of it, they just had to work. They just had to find ways to be involved and to, to help, um, help us organize. So essentially we did about five exhibitions. And the good thing about it is that it, it was a very multi-generational, it became a very multi-generational effort. All the efforts we did were very multi-generational. So they, welcomed people that were like us coming out of college and people that were very established. Mm -hmm. And I think the drive um, behind founding this artist collective was to create opportunities instead of waiting for them to show themselves, right? So when you're co going out of college, when you're getting out of college, you're just like, okay, I have all this work. What do I do with it? And it's hard to convince people that, you know, what, what, to show it and to, to believe in you. So we started creating our own opportunities to show our work. And we started getting a lot of traction and a lot of support from the local art community. And the more established artists started really supporting our efforts to create these spaces um, for dialoguing, for inter intergenerational dialogues. Um, and, and, and then we also started organizing further outside of this collective. This is another conversation and, and even more multi-generational. Multi I was working at the, as an Ernesto Neto's first assistant. He's a very established Brazilian artist and he was always a very, very generous with his time and always very present in these discussions. And there were all, already discussions happening about decolonizing public spaces, decolonizing uh, public art, and kind of creating things that were more in tune with what was being produced in the present and contemporary art. We were also interested in, in getting more efficient, more, more, more efficient funding and, and kind of just like more connected to our needs and demands. So we started organizing. So this is group Pi. Rewind, just want to give you a look and feel. We exhibited in regular uh, galleries, but we also exhibited in non conventional spaces like a ferry boat. We just took an exhibition into a regular running ferry boat that is crossing the Guanabara Bay, um, which was a lot of fun and insane. And, you know, 5 a.m., we were there installing the show, and by the end of the day, it was done. And, you know, we had crossed the Guanabara Bay. I don't know. How many times we didn't even know which side we were on at the end of the day it was a pretty interesting experience and it was also very cherished by by the artists that were um, with us and again we occupied houses houses under construction galleries we had symposiums um, with local museum directors with curators with people that were very experienced and very knowledgeable and and also people that just had a lot of energy and, and really wanted to make a change. So it was a good combination. 
here you see with a little bit of the of the of the crew not all of it there was a lot of people involved at some point and then we get to the kind of more uh the other part of the community organizing which was more related to establishing a dialogue with our our government municipally and federally so this is Joubert Fajou he was the minister of culture um, when Lula was our president and he was a very fantastic person to dialogue with because he is a musician and a, pretty much a Brazilian musical legend um, if you don't know him look him up Joubert Fajou he's fantastic uh, but he was also a Minister of Culture and dialoguing with him was fairly easy in that sense um, because he understood that what we were demanding was was for the greater good. We were trying to improve things for everyone and you know it was a, a pretty um, everyone was kind of donating their time and that's pretty cool. This is the other Minister of Culture we dialogued with, Zhuka Fajero, and this is us in the, in the what do I call this, uh, uh, a place where representatives meet <laughs> and we're doing a little protest and kind of listening to the to the meetings they were having and kind of getting a little bit of um, language and vocabulary to create our own demands. Um, here in the bottom left I just put a little bit of Ernesto's work so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, this is in the boy men's, uh, when I say I was his first assistant it means I traveled the world um, installing his work this was, I think, the, at the time, the biggest piece he created, and at this point, he has created way bigger things and all very gorgeous, but it's good to have a, a sense of what his style is. He's a fantastic sculptor and very generous in terms of um, helping organize. And then, you know, again, we go back to Carnaval. Carnaval permeates everything, and, and this is us protesting the, the building of a Guggenheim with taxpayer money. So basically we were just not okay with having um, to pay $60 million per year just for the name of the franchise at the Guggenheim. So essentially we got representatives again, local representatives together, and we basically said, no, we, we can't do that. We have public spaces that need funding. We have other things that need funding, other ways we can spend this money. And it's and the, the museum is gonna be built half underwater in the Guanabara Bay, which is like, half under sewer. So it was just a bad idea. In the end it got, we, we stopped the, the, the building of it and that was another victory. And I think one of the biggest victories we had was organizing with um, not just the visual arts sector but also um, um, theater and dance and, and music as well. And we demanded an increase for the whole budget of, of arts and culture for the country to go from 0.3% to 1%. And we succeeded in that too. That was a big articulation. That was a very interesting movement. And it was, I'm, I'm so happy that I, that I got this experience to be a part of it and to donate my time. It was totally worth it. So, yeah. So, and again, you see the flags there. I think you can see them here. There's the flag here and the flag here. This is actually one of my pieces um, that I created when Lula was elected. Lula was the first uh, left-wing president elected in Brazil. And, you know, Brazil's history, I can't go into detail here, otherwise I'm just going to be talking for like three hours about Brazilian history, and that's not what I'm here to do. But um, it's complicated. There's a, you know, we had like in the 30s and 40s a little bit of flirting with fascism and Nazi fascism and things that are not great, nationalism. And, and the flags, they kind of allude to that. This is the, the Museum of the Republic, which was actually the, the palace of the Republic, where Getúlio Vargas, which was one of our presidents, lived and actually committed suicide in. Like, it is said that he committed suicide. We're not sure. He it's a shot through the heart. We think he was killed. But it doesn't matter. That's one of those complications with Brazilian history. And the flags are there kind of alluding to this history. Of, of flirting with fascism and whatnot, but if you separate them, if you separate the colors, if you have just the black and the red, it's actually a very big allusion to the uh, African Brazilian religion, Kamble, Ishu. Ishu is huge. He is the keeper of crossroads. He is the deity that you have to ask permission if you want to speak to other deities. So it's a very spiritual meaning as well. Um, kind of like the streets are. are this domain. 
Um, so yeah, so red and black. It's also Flamengo, the biggest soccer team um, in, in I'm, I'm not going to say in Brazil, but it, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Everyone loves Flamengo. Anyway, and then red and white is the Workers' Party, uh, Lula's party um, that he founded and that has been incredibly vilified and dragged through the mud for, for bad and good reasons. I mean, Lula was incarcerated without a crime. Juma was ousted without a crime. So all these things, you know, are, are things to think about um, when we think about authoritarianism. And now we have Jair Bolsonaro in power, which is pretty much a fascist. Um, I can't, there's no other word that I can say that I think defines it. Unfortunately, it's sad, but it's true. Um, so the flags kind of come back. This is a little bit of like raunchiness that I wanted to share that like so many things were happening at once. And I think the, the idea of, of creating art is circumstantial to me. And the circumstances demanded, you know, performance and time-based. So this is a band, which is actually not a band, it's a performance. It's called the Black Cube. So it's a reference to the white cube, but the black cube, so the opposite of that. And we were kind of making fun of the art world and, and creating these really funny lyrics. Um, my sister and I, this is my sister here, uh, we're not musicians, but the people that we were with are very talented musicians. So we were kind of lucky and spoiled to have these people with us creating like music, real mu music. Um, <laughs> but it was, yeah, more of a performance than a band. And again, circumstantial, um, the idea of, of the time-based work. Um, this is a Pachtelaji, this is an art school that, that I'm performing in here. And these are 100 uh, alarm clocks that are set to ring simultaneously. And it's so funny because alarm clocks are obsolete. They're completely obsolete now. So it's, it's almost like a little relic, this piece, because now everybody has a, a phone that does the, the alarm clock. Um, function. So this is very funny to me to look at this. And um, the alarm clocks would ring all at once and the performance piece consists of uh, me or a performer blindfolded, uh, shutting them down one by one until silence is restored. And you know, it's about like, it's related to the Borg and the, the idea of, of time being sped up and kind of this desperation that we have of like getting up, going places. And we're kind of in this limbo right now and it's reminding me of, of this kind of slowing down that I think needs to happen in our lives. Um, for context again, I like giving context. This is the place that I was in. This is the art school in Rio. It's just this gorgeous building. If you look closely, it's a little falling apart, but it's so beautiful. <laughs> and the gardens are just stunning. And I was performing in this room here that you see that is just absolutely regal and beautiful and there's this pool it was built for a opera singer back in the day and we still are fortunate to have that space as an art school um moving forward again we're gonna it's gonna be a little bit of a roller coaster between performance sculpture and written <laughs> work and again this is kind of the soft sculptures uh what happened to them kind of where they evolved into and this is the corporate hybrid um my sculptures my soft sculptures are a little more existentialist i would say but they all have a little bit of a commentary so in this piece it's kind of the idea of a corporate expansion almost in a viral way of this thing that replicates and kind of creates this this um creeping movement of taking over everything and you know i I kind of wish that I had, uh, I would like to finish the sculpture at some point or create a new one to continue it with like the little uh, suits that you'll see in other pieces that I've made. So I just wanted it to spread more and more to give us the sense of like how uh, the corporate mentality kind of creeps into everything and kind of dominates our lifestyle and our way of thinking. And, and then we go from, this is actually the view of that building that I was showing you earlier uh, from the kitchen, uh, my mom's house, <laughs> from Rio <laughs> to <laughs> New England, <laughs> to Boston. <laughs> and here's my studio back at SMFA when I was doing, pursuing my MFA degree at SMFA at Tufts in Mission Hill. Um, 
Here I'm working with the with excerpts from the Hermetica, the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, which is a very ancient Egyptian text um, talking about science, religion, the cosmos, and love as being one, which is a fascinating concept to me. So lives in my heart. Um, and you know, it got translated by um, the, the Christian um, uh, priests and whatnot. So it's a little diluted the, the translations, but if you look closely, you will see the a lot of good stuff in there. Um, this continues with the kind of idea of the of the written pieces of the Coney Island of the Mind. This is an ongoing series that I've been creating for 16 years now. And this is a solo show I did in Sao Paulo at uh, Scott Cruz Gallery. And there's such a weird uh, collection of authors. You know, there's Hacking Bay, who is actually not an author, but a collective of people that go by that name. Um, there's Guy Debord. There's uh, Luciano Fabro, who is an artist from the Arte Pavra. There's um, Henri Lefebvre and, and some beat poets that I created smaller pieces for. Um, and here, again, I always love making murals, so it's always like this. I like when the piece is kind of almost like <laughs> overwhelming um, when you're near it. So that's, that's kind of like the idea of creating murals. I always want them to be public. These, I create the canvases because I have to, right? It's, I can't create a mural every month and mural well, every month I would, every week, no. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's hard to get a mural, a, a big public wall, but the idea is always to bring these texts that may be a little obscure, that may be a little um, conflicting or, or uh, to bringing some type of, of you know, obscure um, topics into light. So, you know, Guy Debord is a Marxist, and here in America, if you say Marxist, there's like panic, it's like, it's okay, it's just a Marxist, this is just a theory, it's fine, but very interesting uh, ways of thinking. Uh, and then again, performance, and this was done uh, for the opening reception, and this was developed during my MFA, and I wanted to create another way to relate to text, and it kind of like just dawned on me one day, I don't even remember how, that I wanted people to consume text in another way that it wasn't just reading. So I was like, wait, maybe people can eat the text or drink it. <laughs> so this is uh, some vodka on that plate. And these are little sugar words that I put into the plates, onto the plates. They melt. I put the liquid back into a shot glass and I offer it to the viewer. And the funny thing about giving people like a shot of vodka with a lot of sugar, it gives them a little head rush. <laughs> Nothing terrible, but you know, if you've had a very sweet drink in your life and kind of like drink it quickly, you know that it gives you a little, you know, head rush. Um, so the piece is called uh, Under the Influence, Sugar Words Under the Influence. And these are excerpts from the Hermetica. Again, the, the Hermetica is something that kind of always comes back um, when I'm thinking about theory and art. And just because it's a little long, I'm going to go to the end just so you see people taking them and preparing to experience a rush of alcohol and sugar. <laughs> yep, there we go. Um, anyway, and yeah, that was, that's a, a fun piece. Okay. Oh, sorry, I skipped. Um, and then we go back to the writing. So, and, and this is actually here in New England, and this was the first mural I created in New England, in, in Boston. And um, this opportunity came up through Joe Kettner from Emerson College. Joe is unfortunately has passed, um, very sad. He was a good friend and a very generous person. Uh, and he, you know, this, at Emerson, he is the, the guest, no, not guest creator, creator in residence. So basically he teaches, he taught a class um, where his students would curate shows at the Hewitt Inspector Gallery, which is inside of the, of the, the buildings of, of Emerson. They're, it's not necessarily public, but the students would go through the art institu institutions in Boston, pick uh, people they wanted to show, and 
create these exhibitions as part of this class that Joe taught. And Joe was actually very generous again and let me paint directly onto the wall, which is, you know, it, we probably had to you know, paint the wall and yeah, probably. <laughs> it is what it is, it's art. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they, they took this to the next level. And, and then this is my thesis show. Um, and again, Boston, right? I think at this point we're here, I've been here for 10 years. So it's, it's, it's not that little, it, you know, it adds up. And the, the program at SMFA uh, required for your graduation that you create a thesis show. And this was what I created at the Laconia Loft Gallery uh, in Harrison Ave. And basically, these are all soft sculptures. The one in the back is called Battle. This one's called the Replicant Hybrid. This is kind of a recurring theme with the sculptures I make. And this is called Middle Gray. Um, so this one in particular, this one has a good story. Um, this is actually two sculptures. The one on the right is called uh, Maneuver. And the one on the left is called We're Not at War with Vietnam Anymore. And this one was named in a funny situation. So I had a critique with uh, Helen Molesworth, and it was an open critique. It was done through a draw in my MFA, and I was selected to do this open critique. So we set up, and you know, people could come in the room and watch it, and um, she was there critiquing your work. And, and um, it was, I'm going to say, terrible. <laughs> It was a horrendous critique. It was, uh, and I watched two, one other critique that she did, and it was also terrible. So I don't know if she was having a bad day or what. But essentially, I was talking about this piece. I was, I was working on this piece and uh, creating this piece with the military critiques, with the Brazilian military critiques that are green. And I remember her response to that was, "Oh, we're not at war with Vietnam anymore, honey." And I was just so weirded out by that. I was just very confused. And, you know, it didn't seem like, like to her, anything existed beyond America and beyond, uh, you know, the conflicts that were happening through North America or the Middle East at the time. Um, you know, this is, this is a very common thing to, to Brazilian. Like, this is our fatigues. Look, we, we live in the jungle. So, yeah, we have great fatigues. <laughs> So I decided to create another one with the desert fatigues and call it, we're not at war with Vietnam anymore. So thank you, Helen Molesworth, kind of like not, probably not intentional of her <laughs> to name my piece, but she gave me a fantastic title. So out of a very terrible critique, I think that was a good outcome of naming um, the next piece that I created. Um, and, and so this one was born, which is called Battle. And again, this is a part of the same show um, with the idea that, you know, violence and, and uh, weapons, they are always two ways in, my, in the way I think about them. I think people are very, um, I don't know, they're confused about weapons. They think that they, if you have it, you will be protected. But once you shoot, you will have to be prepared to be shot at. <laughs> So, you know, a bullet is never a one-way thing. It's definitely a two-way thing. So the idea of a bullet meaning that you are inflicting violence and pain, but that you will probably be uh, a victim of that as well um, if you go down that route. Um, same exhibition, uh, the Middle Gray Sculpture. It's a social pyramid, essentially. And, you know, a lot of my works, it's it's... Better to see them in person because the level of detail, unfortunately, you can't really get on a screen like this. But we try, right? It's what we have, so we have to use it. So at the very top, there's these very, very fancy people. And as you go down the pyramid, the clothes get, you know, the, these are pretty ragged and old. Um, and it's the idea that, you know, to, for the 1% to exist, there is a wide, a widening. Um, base of people supporting uh, the wealth at the very top. So, you know, it, it's called middle gray because in, in truth, what I'm interested in is kind of the average between that and kind of a much more circular, um, horizontal type of, of situation in our society instead of this very high pyramidal and kind of, you know, having a very small top and a very wide base. 
I don't think that's a good system. Um, so if you go, it, it's very soft, it's very kind of non-threatening in a way, but then as you approach it, you will see that there's a little bit of commentary. Ooh, this is a little fuzzy. Anyway, this is more of these little sculptures. This one's talking a little bit more about um, love. And this one's the oblivious hybrid. It's a little rainbow. And to me, to me, it talks about the idea that love doesn't know who feels it. It could be anyone <laughs> in any combination of form or shape. Um, so this one's two uh, ladies intertwined. These are two guys intertwined. This is a cis couple. And this is just a oblivious. It's called oblivious because it doesn't know and it doesn't matter. But again, I'm always messing with the, with the representation of clothes in my work and how they, they have so much meaning. I'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, we're still on the roller coaster going, woo, <laughs> between one thing and the other. And this is a mural that I created, again, with Joe Kettner. Joe Kettner, as I mentioned, became a very good friend and a very big supporter of my work. I'm very grateful to him. Um, and this is was at, at Emerson as well, at the entrance of, at the Walker building. And we started a conversation thinking of how to assure those students in very dark space, a very kind of poorly lit space. So I thought, bright colors, let's brighten this place up. A lot of neons using the, the text of Marshall McLuhan and his aphorisms that talk a lot about media and the experience of, of instant communication. And you know, Emerson is a, a media heavy school and they have, it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, I suggested Marshall McLuhan, but they have a pretty good relationship with the Marshall McLuhan Foundation. So that was really kind of serendipitous and I always wanted to work with his work, his text. So it was kind of fantastic that they were excited to work with and it was a collaboration. Again, my written works that are public, I like for them to be collaborations. So this was a big conversation that I had with Joe Kettner and Rob Small from Emerson College of what should we put in this wall, right? What, what message, what the medium is the message, right? That's much more cool. But um, what, what, is, what is the idea to usher people in? And unfortunately, this one was destroyed because this area was all renovated. Um, and okay, again, the roller coaster. We go to sculpture, back to sculpture. And this one has a little bit of sound. I'm going to turn it down a little. But so this this goes back to I guess you know thinking about this roller coaster and going back and forth between media and, and what I do. I think there's always this kind of weaving thread of wanting to get people involved with what I do, get, wanting people to participate in what I do, and think in ways that are collaborative instead of competitive. Right, so this piece essentially was this massive lump of hearts in the middle of the gallery. That was the only thing in the beginning of the show. And people were invited to come in and exchange something with me that would stay in the gallery. But the caveat was they had to bring something that had a story. It couldn't just be an object that randomly they just picked. They had to tell the story to me like, why? Why are they bringing that? Why does it remind you of something good or affections, right? And, and it was such a freaking amazing experience to talk to people and to listen to their stories. And it was so fun. And, you know, this, this big mass of hearts kind of started diminishing as the gallery became filled with stories that were an object, these random, random objects that were just so filled with love and stories. Um, and I did ask people to fill a form when they traded with me. So I would remember what these things were and I did put it in my website again if you if any of the works that you see you're kind of curious to know more about them because this is really quick and I'm trying to like show you a lot in a very short period of time um, please visit my website go go enjoy it go go spend time with it it's it's you know it's there okay oh so we go back to the idea of, of clothing right i'm fascinated by by clothing and how clothing has so much um it's so symbolic in our society and how you know we see a dress and we immediately kind of like think feminine or we see a suit and we immediately think of male power and uh, i think that these symbols are slowly starting to be 
uh, broken apart and, and reconfigured, but we're not, we're so far from actually achieving it. Um, you know, I always have these conversations with, with my male friends, um, especially the cis men, like, wow, it's so sad that you cannot wear a dress. It is such a fantastic experience to wear a dress or a skirt. It is so comfortable and so nice. <laughs> and it's just like, it's such a shame. Or makeup, it's fun. It's like a fun thing to wear. And, and it's, it's just, it weirds me out that like, there's like these such rigid divisions in, in our society and the way that we organize. Um, but yeah, so again, and, and there are other layers here with the idea of replication and reproduction. So these little figures are coming out of this bigger figure, but at the same time, the bigger figure is coming out of the little figures. So it's unclear kind of if one is generating the other, if it's sprouting, if it's unclear. So the, the, also the weirdness of just being human and kind of taking a step back and thinking, we're weird, we're super strange. like. <laughs> We're very strange beings. <laughs> yeah, not seeing ourselves as like normal, like normality is overrated. Um, this is kind of in the same vein. Um, I, I continue some of my works that just kind of recycle some, some ideas and concepts, and this is an example. These are these utensils that are made of stainless steel, and they're kind of impossible. They're just not made to be very easily used. And they do speak a little bit about sparsity and abundance, and we'll get to that a little further down the line because I created another piece that I think communicates that better. But I do like this, it was at the Navi Annex, which is unfortunately not open anymore, but I have, it's close to my heart, I really love that space. Um, it was such a little, inside a house in Somerville, um, right next to Red Bones, and just, you know, art exhibitions were had in there, which was pretty fascinating. Okay, so now we get to the stuff Latina. <laughs> so um, again, performance, right? Sometimes I feel like the, the circumstances, they request a certain approach. And I think the stuff Latina was kind of me coming to terms with like this, this, this need to self define in America. So visually, I'm super, super white. Culturally, I am Latin. And that conversation is really hard to have because um, there's this kind of shutdown that happens visually in America. It's just kind of like you check a box and you're done. <laughs> you are what you, what you look like and it's just let's stop talking about it. And it's, I'm, I'm mortified by that because it really takes away uh, the richness of people's experiences and their culture and their, their worldview and kind of just clumps people in, into these um, groups that, that even like when I have to check a box, you know, it's like Hispanic or, or Latina, but even like sometimes not even Latin, there's only Hispanic. And I'm like, wait, I don't speak Spanish, I speak Portuguese. So all these things, um, you know, I was talking to a curator friend that's doing a, a master's here in America, and I like saying this because I, I thought that, you know, maybe I was overreacting, I don't know, but then he actually, without me prompting him, spoke in a very similar way about this experience of like having to self-identify. And, you know, he's olive-skinned, he looks, he's a gorgeous man, <laughs> um, olive-skinned, like beard, dark hair, and he could be from so many places. He could be Spanish, Middle Eastern, uh, Brazilian, I don't know, so many places. But here, he felt that it was, people put that as kind of a, a, a prerequisite almost, that you have to self-identify as something. And I think this struggle with, you know, moving here, being an immigrant, arriving here, being Brazilian, and having kind of to speak to that and, and and have to fit into certain categories and check boxes. So the Stealth Latina essentially talks about that, about um, being from a different culture, but passing as, as white, or you know, the, the whole cultural um, discourse that comes with being white in, in America. And there are other kind of, what you call it? I mean, these are little talking heads. You won't be able to really see what they're saying. Again, if you want to actually see what they're saying, please go into my website and 
you know, spend time with them. But, you know, there's Tom as well. Tom is um, my male, um, what do you call it, uh, alter ego or brain or the part of my brain that's masculine, whatever. I, I believe in fluidity. And I do believe that um, sexuality in general is a state of mind. So yeah, Tom, Tom is speaking about being a, an artist and, and the expectation of being a woman artist, a woman artist and, and how it's expected that you speak to that um, when sometimes it's just, that's, it's that kind of, um, kind of stops the conversation or puts like too many boundaries in the conversation. So Tom is kind of going into that and the artist is kind of just being, <laughs> being like, <laughs> how do I say this, <laughs> a weenie and like crying and being sad about, you know, lack of opportunities and, and how, how it's hard to be an artist sometimes, but it's humorous. It's, it's supposed to be funny and, and have a little bit of a, a comic flair to it. So yeah, I, I, I can't really explain it. Unfortunately, you have to see what they're saying. The devil is kind of the devil's advocate and it's saying all the things that, you know, sometimes I feel like, I shouldn't or that are not that I don't want to say but it's the devil the devil can say whatever it wants there's no you know the devil is evil <laughs> the devil is it has a free pass to say whatever <laughs> okay and then we go back to writing yay <laughs> so this was the Walter Feldman fellowship um, that I was awarded in 2016. If there are many artists in here tonight, if there are any artists in here tonight and you haven't had a solo show, I highly recommend applying uh, for this fellowship. It's through the Arts and Business Council of Greater Boston. They are fantastic. They're very supportive. Um, and you know, the, the whole idea behind it is that it culminates with having a solo show, which was my first solo show in America, which you know, it's to me, it's huge. I, I've had four solo shows in Brazil, and I've only had one in America, and I've been here for 10 years. So it's something to be said about that. Um, so very grateful for this opportunity. And this is at the Piano Craft Gallery, which is also a fantastic place that, you know, offers a lot of opportunities for, for mid-career artists. Um, essentially, the work here is um, self-referential. It's the first time that I've actually written uh, used my own text um, in my work and it's it's pretty it's it's humorous it's angry and the canvases they actually speak to you so I'm kind of like excusing myself from the conversation and saying no nah, it's just the paintings talking it's not me it's the, I'm not saying that it's the painting <laughs> so and you know this the these three were kind of inspired by my time working as a visitor assistant at the ICA. It was, I think, my first job out of my MFA. And it's, it's, I guess it's important to say this, but like, you know, I, I, I had come from like Brazil and, and having like worked and done other things. And, and suddenly I had to kind of reinvent myself here because I didn't know anyone and I didn't have any of the connections or the, the experience wasn't, um, it wasn't perceived as, as comparable because it's another country. So I don't know, it's, it's hard for people to understand what you did somewhere else. So essentially I was a VA kind of, um, as a way to kind of pay the bills a little bit. It pays very little, but you know, you're in a museum and the people, the other VAs were fantastic people, such good friends I made being a VA, but the job itself was hard and low paying. <laughs> you had to stand in the galleries of five minute bathroom breaks and um, no sitting for hours on end on concrete. So it kind of fueled this idea of kind of ranting about, you know, the expenses and the hardships of being an artist. And then kind of making a joke here with like how art now is made as almost like a selfie uh, opportunity. And so I'm just like, you know what? If you don't want to read any of this, if you're just done with it, just don't read it. Go take a selfie and <laughs> have fun. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm always giving people, I think, the opportunity to kind of either engage or not. Um, again, this is a lot of reading. So if you're in the space, you kind of like stuck with it. If it's like this, I don't expect everyone to read this um, and, and spend enough time with it. 
Again, if you want to read it, please visit my website. It's all there. And this one's kind of talking about how I became an artist. Again, the painting is talking about how I became an artist and my references and, and inspirations and, and rolling the boulder up the hill like the myth of Sisyphus, that the artist's work is always starting over and over and over again. And that's part of, of being an artist is having to enjoy the process of rolling this boulder uphill um, indefinitely. It's kind of like that's that's we need to enjoy it otherwise it makes no sense and then it goes into kind of a more mystical um kind of thought of macro of like going a little further out and and seeing the beauty in things of seeing the beauty in being an artist the beauty of being alive the beauty of existence of, of atoms and molecules and <laughs> all that good stuff um and you know, the, again, the painting talks to you and it really asks you to spend time with it. And it talks about you as the viewer having to keep this, this internal dialogue going um, and just having critical thinking as, as part of your responsibility as a viewer, right? <laughs> it's like, here's a provocation, now go think. <laughs> so yeah. and. There we go, people love selfies. <laughs> this is very fun. Um, to the bottom left, you can see a compilation of selfies. Um, there were more, but I, I got the best ones, but people love doing that. It's funny, we human beings, we're funny. We, we love selfies. <laughs> okay, so here we got to Mass Mocha. This is my studio. I had the studio for two weeks. Um, it actually got more messy than this. Now that I look at it, I think, wow, this is, this is not the worst that it, that it looked. <laughs> but essentially, I created a lot of really large sculptures in two weeks. I was working full time at the time. So these two weeks felt like, like I, I just had this opportunity that I had to work like, like in a trance. I, I, I worked like nonstop for two weeks. I, I don't even know what happened. It was just a, a blur. And this, this sculpture is kind of, again, going to this more existential part of my production, which is this kind of figure that is hanging upside down and kind of giving, originating other little figures. You see there's like little clothing, again, the doll clothes. Um, and again, I think it, it actually reminds me a lot of the tarot card, the hanged man which is uh, symbolizes sacrifice. So there's always a sacrifice in our, our existence in order to create other things. So even what we eat, um, our family, um, the way we work, there's always sacrifice. You know, you know we, we kill daily to eat. So that in itself, or like, you know, your mother puts you into this world and, and then has to like feed you and clothe you and that's also sacrifice. So, but at the same time, it's soft and it's beautiful. So it's kind of the bittersweet or the violent yet sweet uh, aspects of existence. <laughs> and on the far left, there's the embrace, which is traced around my own body. But you know, because I was tracing myself, it shifted and it looks really weird and like all crooked and strange. Um, and it's a, kind of a conversation about body dysmorphia and how we see our imperfections and kind of really sometimes obsess over our imperfections. Uh, but this one, in this case, it's, it's kind of accepting it and giving itself this like hug of, of acceptance and love over its own imperfections. So it's, it's a very loving, it's a love letter to, to imperfection and, and how we, we, we see them as, as bad and they're not necessarily bad. <laughs> um, middle one is a blue link. It's, it's inspired by the, um, the idea of the uh, symposium which is a, a Plato uh, a book and or passage. And it's about love and how in Greek mythology, there's this one, okay, they're all drinking, having fun and talking about love. And this one participant in the discussion brings up that um, human beings were once one, like two actually. So two sets of heads, two sets of arms, four sets of arms, four sets of legs, two genitals all together in no particular gender combination, but that because of hubris or arrogance towards the gods, we get separated. And that after that, we 
spend our lives looking for the other half and once we find it we try to hold on to this other half and become one again um, the idea in this is that it, it has a lot of other links connected, not just one, but that it would, you know, there would be several links representing all these relationships between humans. Um, but anyway, it's someday. <laughs> and then again, this is Masnoka. Again, this is the forks and the idea of scarcity and abundance. So people, um, some people have a better access to the food here. Some people find it harder to access the food. And this piece to me speaks a lot about collaboration again and how seeing this happen is so fascinating because the people that participate, some people don't want to participate at all, but the people that do, they're very gentle to each other and they're very, very collaborative. And, and you know, this whole idea of like the, what you call it, the walking dead, that everyone's killing each other and like everyone's like, ah. and no, we, we have this other way of thinking and they're much more generous and collaborative and, and kind than we make ourselves be or that you know uh, gun porn makes us look so this is you know a, a note to that that we can think in collaborative ways okay and then we get to this which is uh, the leftovers from the exhibition that i showed you that i created this beautiful dress um, and had these beautiful humans model it for me this is such a a, a lucky moment that you know I, I created the dress and I had these people that uh, really understood the spirit of it and dressed it so beautifully and it's made to dress anyone that wants to wear it it's an armor for delicate bodies and ideas so essentially it's a it's a dress but it's it's again I want everyone to wear dresses <laughs> or be able to if you want to that's, that's, I guess, the, the, and again, more participatory stuff. I really like the idea of participatory. And these are embracers. They're made to hug you and kind of mimic this idea of, of pleasure and, and intimacy of kind of bow and, and, you know, hugging and, and celebrating. And this was an area gallery, unfortunately, that we moved to Seattle, so we don't have area gallery anymore. But this was a pop up at his space, and it was a lot of fun. It was a party, we danced, we embraced. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and again, this is just a, a view of the, of the same pieces that I showed you from Asmoka that were on view at area. Um, we're almost done. If you're getting tired, I get it. It's, I've been like babbling here for a while. <laughs> we're almost there. Um, this is in the downtown Boston. It was commissioned by the Boston uh, downtown bid and the literary district. And this was such a cool opportunity to learn more about the writers that are local to Boston. Um, I learned a lot. One of them, uh, so I worked with the literary district in collaboration and they gave me some options of authors that were in that kind of related to that area. So I picked Margaret Fuller, who was an early feminist and was one of the first feminists to have her work published. I picked Edward Bellamy, who uh, created a utopian sci-fi, uh, socialist sci-fi in the 1800s, which is hilarious. This uh, industrialist man from the 1800s, he goes into a coma and he, mystical coma. It's very badly explained why, but it's, it's very funny. It's a very funny book. And he wakes up in the year 2000 and it's a socialist utopia and he's basically the his hosts in the future are explaining to him why um the socialist society is so much more efficient and better than his um bourgeoisie <laughs> uh industrialist kind of approach to life and it's very didactic and very cute because it's like you know they think of credit cards but then it's like a piece of wood and you're like wait what <laughs> so it's it's funny it's it's very and then there's eddie eddie is a contemporary um spoken word person um lgbtqia advocate puerto rican fantastic person i met them at the Villa victoria center for the arts uh presenting his work and it was just really fascinating so to me, the really cool part is that it's kind of in a, in a, a linear kind of a timeline. And Eddie is, is here with, you know, alive and, and producing. So basically I had the, the honor and privilege to ask Eddie to create a little blurb. Essentially it was kind of a, 
a challenge probably because they reached out to them and I said, hey, can you write something with this amount of characters? And, and, and he did. So it was a very fun experience. Um, let me see. Yep, more of that. And ta-da, 2020. <laughs> so this is my most recent work. Uh, it's a mural at Emerson College again. So at this point, uh, Leone Bradbury is uh, doing a fantastic work there with the Emerson Contemporary. And I got a call from them during the pandemic. This was all done during the pandemic, saying that they had uh, found anti-Semitic and uh, white supremacist graffiti in the campus and that they had spoken to those students and the students had requested that a piece of art be created in response. So they thought of me, which I was so happy because this was, you know, such an honor and, and such a great opportunity to, again, bring, bring these authors that speak truth to power and put them on a wall, <laughs> which is kind of makes me very happy and satisfied. I started thinking of Hannah Arendt because I wanted to work with a female author and a Jewish author. Um, but as the conversation continued, you know, the students really wanted something uplifting. And the day we were supposed, we were meeting to have the final decision was on uh, July 30th. That morning, Leone sent me an email and said, hey, look at this text published uh, as an op-ed op by um, John Lewis. It's his like message uh, to be read in his funeral, at his funeral for his passing. And it was just so beautiful and I had goosebumps and I took the text to the meeting to the student advisory board that was working with us and everybody loved it. Everybody was really excited about it and it just seemed like John Lewis was addressing all of the issues um, the, and, and really, really head on against bigotry and against structural racism, but at the same time really giving us hope and, and being very positive in his message. So it just turned out to be everyone agreed and it's always great when a group agrees. And it, it happened to be the one that, that's there now. <laughs> Don Lewis, yes, his beautiful words. I, I have great admiration for him. And now um, here I am at the Umbrella Center for the Arts in Concord, where I'm in residency uh, until February. And one of the things that I'm doing here, as you can see behind me here, is uh, painting an in-scale version of this mural. I am infatuated with, with his words, with his life story, with his resilience, with you know, his just absolute uh, raw power of, of this man that dedicated his life to kind of making the world better and, and ending structural racism and bigotry peacefully that, you know, I just, I thought, well, the mural, you make it and it stays there and it's inside the campus. But I wanted something that, you know, I could put different places that could go and, and, and not be stuck in one particular place. So this is why I'm thinking this. And then, you know, I'm also, again, hell-bent in creating more uh, works with women authors. This is kind of a, I'm on a mission right now. It's been something that has, I, I found out just by looking at my work from 16 years back being like, wow, I worked with a lot of male authors and very few women authors. So at this point, I'm kind of really focused on, 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 on mending that um, and in adding the, the, the women that speak truth to power because they do too. <laughs> so to close off today, I'm gonna just read a little Diane de Prima. It's, uh, her book is called Revolutionary Letters, and I just am so in love with her writing and with, um, with her message, and I'm going to be working on, on a couple of paintings with her text. So, you know, I'm going to try my best to read well. It's hard because it's poetry, but cope with me. <laughs> so, uh, Revolutionary Letter number 40 for Emmett Brogan. If the power of the word is anything, America, your oil fields burning, your cities in ruins, smoldering, pillaged by children, your cars broken down at a standstill, choking the roads, your citizens standing beside them, bewildered, or choosing a packload of objects, what they can carry away, 
If the power of the word lives, America, your power lines down, eagle-eyed lines of electric, of telephone towers, of radio transmission, toppled and rankling in the fields, setting the hay ablaze, your newspapers useless, your populace illiterate, wiping their asses with them. If the word has power, you shall not stand, America. The wilderness is spreading from the parks you have fenced it into. Already, desert blows through Las Vegas. The sea licks its chops at the oily edges of Los Angeles. The camels are breeding. The bears, the elk are increasing. So are the Indians and the very poor. Do you stir in your sleep, America? Do you dream of your power, pastel-colored oil tanks from sea to shining sea? Sleep well, America. We stand by your bedside. The word has power. The chant is going on. Wow, that's, that's intense. This woman, yeah, she, she really. I'm gonna read, they're short. I'm gonna read one more and then, um, then I'm done. <laughs> April Fool birthday poem for Grandpa. Today is your birthday, and I have tried writing these things before. But now, in the gathering madness, I want to thank you for telling me what to expect, for pulling no punches back, back there in that scrub Bronx parlor. Thank you for honestly weeping in time to innum innumerable heartbreaking Italian operas for pulling my hair when I pull the leaves off the tree so I'd know how it feels. We are involved in it now, revolution, up to our knees and the tide is rising. I embrace strangers on the street, filled with their love and mine. The love you told us had to come or we die. Told them all in that Bronx park, me listening in spring Bronx dusk, breathing stars, so glorious to me, your white hair, your height, your fierce blue eyes, rare among Italians. I stood a ways off, looking up at you, my grandpa, people listen to. I stand a ways off, listening, as I pour out soup. Young men with light in their faces, at my table, talking love, talking revolution, which is love spelled backwards. How you would love us all, would thunder your anarchist wi wisdom at us, would thunder Dante and Giordano Bruno, orderly men bent to your ends. Well, I want you to know, we do it for you and your ilk, for Carla, Carlos, Carla Tresca, for Sacco and Vanzetti, without knowing it or thinking about it, as we do it for Aubrey Beardsley, Oscar Wilde, all streetlights shall be purple. Do it for Trotsky and Shelley and big dumb Kropotkin. <laughs> Eisenstein and strike people, John Cocteau's and we. We do it for the stars over the Bronx that they may look on earth and not be ashamed. Wonderful. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, let's see. What's the <laughs> From Liz. Uh, it says, Julia, your text-based paintings have a remarkable consistency in the front uh, handwriting you use. I'm sorry. Uh, it looks sharp-edged. Is it hand-painted? Uh, sharp yet, and I don't know how to pronounce this word, idiosyncratic or informal? Can you talk about that choice? Sure. Yes. Okay. So that's funny because um, actually the, the way I paint these is the, the white of the letters is the canvas. So I paint around the letters. So basically, um, yeah, it's all hand painted and essentially I leave the, the letters blank. Does that make sense? <laughs> so it's, it's negative space. Essentially, each letter is a little bit of like negative space and it's the canvas. If you look closely, you will see a little bit of pencil marks because I marked the canvas with pen pencil and then I paint over it. So essentially all hand painted and all kind of this very, um, very straight lines uh, leaving the canvas show up through the back, <laughs> through, the, through the paint, yeah, if that makes sense. 
Um, if, if anybody wants to ask a question, so you're welcome to unmute yourself and um, ask. Otherwise, I'll be reading them from the, from the chat. Um, and we have a lot of really beautiful comments, too, uh, about Aww. your work. So I'll, I'll make sure to share the chat with you. But uh, next question um, from Lucy. Wow, with the hearts piece, I moved to see how you made room for everyone else's story. How did the experience change you in any way? Question mark. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it just gave me such a different perspective on, on how people see or like how you love an object and, and why. So one good story, someone like brought me a very old hairbrush and the object itself was absolutely disgusting. And I was like, oh, cool. Why? And the story was so incredibly beautiful. So basically, this is a hairdresser, hairstylist that we know from, from Rio, very talented Italian man that immigrated to Brazil. And that hairbrush had been his father's and had been the first hairbrush he had used as a hairstylist. So to me, that like understanding of like, he kept that. It was, it was like something that had zero value, like whatsoever, like, financially like monetarily but it was such a like I after knowing that I was like oh my god this is a little treasure you know and and I think listening to those things and seeing how people treasure these objects that are so simple sometimes just not even like they're so immaterial almost like small or or just not not important to anything but for having the story so it really made me appreciate um, people's affection, like to to the stories and to to telling these stories. And I don't know, there's something about learning something this intimate too that really like creates a different bond between you and and other people, and and also making yourself available to that and 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 being vulnerable and accepting people's vulnerability. I think that's really important and I think that um, it, it, it helped me be in that headspace more perhaps. I don't know. Maybe that's kind of the big takeaway. That's very powerful. Um, next question uh, from Rudolph. Do you see the collaborative and collectivist elements of your work as an extension of your politics? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, even uh, when you're in school, it's, everything is so strange, right? When you're when you're in it, doing your BFA, especially because you're still defining so many things, and I think the ideas are still kind of taking shape. I mean, some some things you will keep working through your life. You're just starting there, and it will evolve and change. Some things will not really change visually, maybe, but the ideas behind it will grow. But I think the same happens with the with the collaboration aspect. Um, and you know, the, and I, I I'm still trying to be more collaborative in the way that I make art as well. And I think that's the kind of of the idea of the mentality shift between collaboration between uh, competition to collaboration. But you can't. Um, substitute um, these experiences of, of community organizing because it, it's such a different experience. You are talking to people that don't understand art, that don't necessarily see the value in art. So, you know, you have to really de develop a discourse um, to get people on your side and, and to get to have an understanding of why you, what you're doing is important and not you as a person, but you as, as, as an artist, as a, a part of a, a, a sector, an, an, an industry, a, a cultural sector, right? So when, when you go into that mindset, I think you kind of, you leave behind a little bit of your individualistic kind of expectations and you have to just be uh, more in tune with being, being in, in this collaborative mode where, where you know, Achieving things is slow and the conversations are slow and agreeing is difficult, but, but it's all worth it. So 
it's a big learning curve, but yes, absolutely. It, I think I'm, I'm very connected to like horizontal and, and circular ideas of organization. I think, you know, hierarchy, it usually brings, it, it brings imbalance in conversations and it brings imbalance in, in social or interactions. Um, and I, I I do love the idea that in art, at least, you can create these spaces that are very horizontal and very um, circular, where hierarchies are temporarily kind of put aside and everyone has the same um, weight and impact in the conversation. So that's, I guess, something that's always on my mind, no matter what I'm doing. Okay. Um, we have another question from Patrick. What's one thing about the art scene you experienced in Brazil that you would want to bring to Boston and vice versa? Wow, M more, more of this um, community organizing. I, I feel like I'm, I'm still, and, and you know, just this year, I think because of the election and everything, the, the trauma that we experienced, the collective trauma that we experienced in these past four years, it just became really important to me that, um, that I, I make space for, for opening these discussions and find people that are interested in having these discussions um, of how we can create um, more efficient, more, um, more lively uh, conversations in, in the art scene here in Boston. Um, I do feel like there's, a, it's very insular, it's always very insular. Artists have a tendency to be insular, to like go into their studios and be very isolated while they're working and I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking of strategies that especially now with the pandemic but thinking of strategies to kind of try to create these networks of people that want to have these discussions and again the, the hard part is that it it really means dedicating or, or volunteering a lot of your time and it's it's hard I, I'm not gonna say it's easy so there's that <laughs> yeah Hey, uh, is there anybody else that has another question or comment? Feel free to drop it in the chat or um, just unmute yourself as well. All right, if not, um, I just want to say that I share the same sentiment as many people in, uh, in this call that um, you did a fantastic job and, and thank you for sharing all your work with us. And it's really exciting to see your trajectory and what you're working on currently as well. Oh, that, that, that means the world to me. And, you know, I, I just, again, I just want to, you know, see everyone again and, and be able to be in, in spaces with you all at some point soon. Because as much as this is, this means the world, it's not the same. And I'm very much looking forward to when I can have in-person conversations with y'all, hug y'all, <laughs> you, you name it, just, you know, have some fun and, and not think about the pandemic anymore. Fingers yeah. crossed, we'll get there. Awesome. <laughs> and I just wanted to share a comment. Um, I think that a lot of the things that I like about your work and what you shared today is that your work is so inviting and it, it entertains people into, into, into these like very important conversations, but in a fun way where you're kind of like tricked into it, but you're like, oh damn, like this is actually really important. And I don't know, I think that's very unique and congratulations on that. Oh, I love that you said tricked into because that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> I always try to trick people into, come on, come on, come on, come this way. I have something to show you. Well, okay, I'm gonna read one last thing for y'all and that I swear to God, it's like two sentences and I'm gonna leave you alone. Revolutionary letter 46. And as you learn the magic, learn to believe it. Don't be surprised when it works. You undercut your power. That's it. 